So here's what we're going to do today. Uh, and some of you are thinking, I've been media trained. I've been through the trenches. You know, what is there left to go over? And you know, the differences we're going to talk about may seem subtle to you. But, they're, but the research is showing that they're important. The other thing I'm going to say and set up is, is that we're going to look at t this morning at what works, what isn't working, and think about some different approaches. And some of you, your first reaction will be, I've heard this all before, this doesn't work, I have this approach works for me, and so forth. Well, give it a try. Now, one example I'll say is that many of you have uh, uh, families. Some of you are in business with your families. You no doubt have learned that different communication styles work. How many of you have got a son or a daughter or somebody else or your brother you're in business with and just telling them the facts doesn't make them do what you want them to do? Every one of you. And the other thing is today, um, we have more facts at our fingertips than ever. And I kind of say facts in quote because almost everyone in this room can pull out your smartphone and Google facts real quick about any subject I put on the table. And if I made it your assignment, you could come up with four pages of facts on both sides of practically every single issue, right? So what's that mean? That means that you go find what supports your point of view. So more than ever, there's no changing our minds. You know, there is a, somebody is of a mind that, about something, and it's hard to, quote, change their mind and come up with a list of facts that will say, okay, fine, I'm going to take a whole different picture. I'm going to take a whole different view. I'm not going to look at your industry the way that I have. That doesn't happen. So the other thing I found different, I, I mentioned to you, I work with the National Pork Producers Council. And one of the things that I was most proud of when I was at the Pork Producers Council is that we did develop a program that preceded the other white meat. Uh, some of you pork producers? Okay. It preceded the other white meat. It wasn't memorable. It was called America is Leaning on Pork. But the two things I was most proud of was that we got into the story differently. And we first had a lot of meetings with growers, with Iowa State, and with others about making sure that we could walk the talk, that we, in fact, were committed as an industry to improvement. And 30, 40 years ago, what the back fat, um, close to two inches wasn't unusual. And, and in fact, the back fat was almost the same as the, wasn't too far away from loin eye size. And we didn't have a lot to brag about. So what this industry did was work on improving uh, through genetics, through feeding programs, through management, and we had a story to improve. And on the tails of that, we started talking about leaner pork, about changing the image of pork. And then one other story on that. There was a book that came out then called Jack Spratt's Legacy of fat and cholesterol in the American diet. Now, that's a, not a very catchy title, <laughs> but it was the, uh, Michael Jacobson wrote it. It was like his, he's now the head of the Center for Science and the Public Interest. It was like his first venture out to get this book out about how bad, you know, fat and cholesterol was before others were saying much about it. And, and so he was going to be on a call-in talk show in New York City and uh, they wanted to get somebody from the livestock or meat industry to do this, to, to appear with him. So they went to the American Meat Institute and said, no, we're not touching that. They went to the National Cattlemen's Association and said, no, we're not touching that. You know, they went to the Pork Producers Council, and I was 29 years old, just there from the Indiana Beef Cattle Association, Orville Sweet called me and said, do you want to go do this? And I said, sure, I'll do it. So I, I went to New York City, my uh, first trip into New York, 
and went on this talk show with Michael Jacobson, and and his book, I think if you anybody can find the book again, I went through the entire book, and he had he had one sentence that he said that, however, the pork producers have made real progress, and uh, you know, in this whole book, and I just kind of stuck to that point. I said. But Michael, you yourself said that hog farmers are, have really, are really changing things. And he said, that's right. He said, you know what? He said, that's what I want to see in agriculture. And, and, and that was one of my proudest moments because um, he was, I think, glad that this naive green kid from Iowa would show up and it probably helped him have an audience because I was there. But I couldn't beat him on, as it turned out, you know, cholesterol isn't so good for you, uh, if we can argue that too. But, but you know, but that whole, his over premise about, about being concerned about coronary heart disease, it wasn't wrong for him to bring that issue up. But we were at the rest of the industry at that time, we're just like fighting, fighting, fighting. And, and I didn't realize it then, but if you can get to the point of yes and, say, yeah, we should be concerned about our health, but look what we're doing. Look what hog farmers are doing. And, and we were at a whole t new, new plateau. So what my, what my goal is this morning is that we talk through, that we think it through a little differently about how we can change, the, improve the conversation. When you can't just beat it, you can't just say, okay, let's have a bigger checkoff. Let's make the checkoff, you know, a dollar a bushel, you know, mandatory dollar a bushel. And, and with that budget, uh, we'll, by God, change, change things. Because the old mentality was that if you had a product to advertise, there were two rules to get through, three really. One is have a good message that's really creative, well executed, makes people think. And then the next two are reach and frequency. So if you get to 90% of your audience, nine or ten times with a message that is persuasive, they'll change their behavior. That's it. That's the, that's the law of advertising. That works. Except when it doesn't. And it's working less and less because the situation is changing. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't be doing advertising because it's clearly working for a lot of products. And for simple products, it's fine. But when you have people that see you in a certain picture, you know, they have a real hard time changing that picture. And I'm, I find it baffling, living out where I do, near the coast in California, that they have such a negative image of corn farmers. Corn farmers, but farmers and ranchers. Now, individually, they say, I like farmers, but they've missed the last 50 years. Now, one other thing I want to, I want to accomplish uh, this morning, too, is that I don't want to, uh, and I won't be critical of any existing efforts. I know you, uh, several of you are here are getting uh, some new programs going. I think they're wonderful. And what I'm, and I think that there's just some kind of subtle things to keep in mind as we're approaching them. So you may find that you're working within a program here, within the Farm Bureau. You're working ways to uh, communicate. You're going to learn this afternoon how to do more with social media. Great, all that's great. A few of these pointers, hopefully, that you can think about the the way the way we approach the issues and what we're finding s uh, people respond to. Now, one other thing to bring us back to Iowa is that not to, you just got rid of uh, a whole bunch of politicians and media people, and, and, and um, one thing that you saw, probably, probably half of you or more met uh, presidential candidates, and, and uh, from, from what I hear, and, uh, and maybe some of you were even in on some of those dial sessions where they'd end up saying, well, boy, when, when Gingrich said that, it really went up. But when Romney said this, nobody believed him and turned the dials up and down. What I'm going to show you is so we did the same thing with some of, some of your messages. U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance is growing like crazy. Like I said, you guys have been able to work on a lot of programs right now. And what's different, and what's even different from, from um, 
years ago when I worked with pork and I've worked with beef, is we would come together, as you come together, on a couple of, a couple of issues. Now it's working? Okay, okay. On a couple of issues. But we've talked about agriculture getting together. Well, you know it's difficult. Uh, and we haven't done that in a way that people have invested and, and stuck with it and tried to figure out how we can really make a difference collectively. And it's finally happening, I think, with the U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. And we have a broad range, over 70 organizations so far, that have come together. And some of the allied industries have made contributions, too. And in the allied industry, John Deere, DuPont, Monsanto, Archer Daniels, Crop Life, and so forth, they're all getting into this, and they're helping, too. But the board are farmers and ranchers. And, and, and yet, even I'm mentioning the fact that we have these other sponsors, we do have a challenge. You bring them, all the companies in, and you look at what do people think about farming today. And they think industrialized modern agriculture, what they see as factory farming, is not sustainable. They say that about American in agriculture. They say about your own industry. And, and maybe even about your, your own farm. Now, I said I, I live in, in uh, Santa Cruz, California. And this is a parade that, was, uh, that they had on, on GMOs, on GMO labeling. And I'm now on their list, and they have nearly every weekend, there's uh, organization meetings in almost every, every town imaginable. Now, Santa Cruz is especially liberal. We're an hour south of San Francisco. UC Santa Cruz is there. The head uh, organic certification organization for, is there. The National Research for Organic Farming is there. It's kind of a, a hotbed. There's farming all around it. And, and it's, it's one of the most active places in the country. But I get emails that are inviting me to like potlucks to, to come on the weekend and, and work on signs and to work on the petition drives. Uh, and so what they're doing right now that, that many of you heard about is that they're having a labeling um, to try to get on the ballot in California uh, a requirement that all foods have uh, be identified if they contain any GMO. So it's it's it says that you know you have to put on the label that you know that it's, it contains GMO. Now they're going after 700,000 signatures because they think they need 500,000 signatures to be on the ballot. And and if they get on the ballot. There's a good chance it'll pass in California because there's nobody talking the other, the other side of it. And it's easy, I think, to sit back in the rest of the country and say, well, there's a bunch of kooks and, you know, um, out there in California that are extreme. But there's 35 million people there. There are others that are going to look at it. There's a large share of influencers that are out there as well. Uh, some of them admit that if they win, and they think they'll win, that there will be lots of court battles trying to stop it from being implemented. However, uh, they think that out of that, someday will come federal regulations, more and more states will follow along, and their arguments are why not give consumers all the information they want. Now, this is the only issue for, for you. There's, there are people get very excited about ethanol. There's people that they get very excited about, about what they see as subsidies. Uh, there's, and also the feeling that you are somehow contributing to runoff is contributing to dead zones going down the Mississippi River and, and the Gulf of Mexico. And then to add insult to injury, I mean, the list about how they feel about your biggest customers on the livestock side and, and today's livestock operations, you know, it's really, really difficult to get in front of, in front of those. a little bit of how do we engage because there is what I'd say is there's a smart reasonable movable middle somebody you asked about one of you asked about the about some of the wild people that are kind of out there on the extreme what I'm thinking is that I sit across from this this couple 
and they're sharp. One of them is a spokesperson for American Dietetics Association. Uh, another one, uh, the, the gentleman on the left has a Hispanic group for on nutrition uh, based out of Atlanta. They have uh, advanced degrees. They're not from the West Coast, they're from the other coast. They, um, but they really believe that agriculture is controlled by the large, big, large corporations and that they're running the show. They're telling you, they're telling you what to do, that you're not telling them what to do. But they're, they're reasonable. You could sit down across the table with them. You would make progress. They represent you know, a key part of what we can work with. There's some people that hell will freeze over before, they, before they're kind of helping you a little bit. But they can come to respect you. And what I've been working on with the Farmers and Ranchers Project is reaching out to a lot of these groups and getting them at the table. And not surprisingly, what, what I'm finding is that first thing is I've got to be open-minded to listen to them. You know, like you were just saying, okay, well, that's a good question. You know, rather than jump into, heck no, we should not be labeled. <coughs> you know, I see your point. And all, all of a sudden, you break down the barriers. The other thing I would say, Larry, some of the people you've talked into joining the corn growers, some of them didn't sign up the first day. <coughs> And I'll bet some of them, it, it was maybe the fourth or fifth time you, you drove into, the, into their barnyard and, and got out and, and talked to them, and they finally kind of came around, right? <laughs> well, you know what? They we're going to find the same thing with, the, I think, the movable middle, too. Um, you say their position all here on GMO. What's their position on fresh water? Oh, well, that's pretty complicated, too. I mean, they are, there's, there's strong, strong positions on, you know, as you can well imagine, I could fill my calendar and go to water meetings every single day. We're, we're kind of unique here in the Midwest where we can produce commodities with fresh water falls out of the sky. And there's a lot of the country that has to use rainwater, snow melt, aquifer, you know. Yeah. And as the population increases, we take fresh water and urban's here and rural's here and you know who's going to win. Well, we're, we're as you know, the uh, city of Los Angeles is buying up farmland to get the water permits and then just letting the land go foul so that they can they can divert the water in the Central Valley. So, you know, it's uh, it, it's a constant battle on the waterfront. But there, there's, there's, not a, there's not an organized group as to this matter that's coming at us Oh, oh, absolutely. There's more than I can count. Uh, but uh, I even went on a walk, though, with farm laborers for water in California because they were, they were uh, farm labor was uh, one, a couple of counties were up to 25% unemployment um, over a year ago when the, when the water cut backs. And so you ended up having a labor movement that's saying, we have to do something different. We have to build a peripheral canal. We have to be able to get back into having some more water stored. We've got to, you know, get you know, all these solutions that they were at the table with the, with the farmers. I think in your case, I think when the fresh water is, yeah, it's fresh when you get it, but when it runs through the farm, how much of it ends up making its way to the Mississippi River? And, and so they, 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 they have, you know, you guys have got more stories on, on nitrogen uh, release and, and, and that you're getting just exactly what you need. And I've heard, Dean, who was it that sat down in St. Louis that um, he, was, he was challenged about his water quality, and uh, do you remember this story? And and that uh, he he let them check it, and his water was better leaving his farm, and they tested every way they can. Then it came on. Yeah, and I don't I don't remember specifically. Do you remember said, that comment though? I don't remember that particular. I, you hear so you many of these because we go through so many of these things. One point I'd like to make about the smart, reasonable people. That's what I find most of the time. And the biggest thing I hear anymore is nobody's ever told me that before. Just like you, you mentioned the water, and that's a big issue of space in the West, but they always come back at you, corn dominates things, you're using it for ethanol. What percentage of it is irrigated? And I say, oh, 14% nationally, and the geologist drops. Damn. They know that that's one of the things that's killing it. Nobody has ever explained any of this stuff. It's all assumptions on what they know from their grandfather's yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah. But that's not untypical with the water. Well, those problems have been solved more than we think. And I, I think that what we're going to talk about is trying to get to those points. Like when you, when you've got another point like that to make, you, you want to find something you can agree with them on, 
and that's a good point, and then kind of more positively, but did you know this or something, you know, and you kind of, you, you get them into that. Sort of, but the one thing that really, really burns me is when you see the commercials about the, the puppy dogs by ASPCA, and at the very end of it, they have the forklift moving the, the whole scene that, you know, it's a downer cow for whatever reason, but, you know, they, they, uh, they portray it as, this huge amount of animal cruelty on on a factory farm or something like that, but you know if if you've ever tried to move a cow that's down, mm -hmm. it's extremely difficult no matter how you're going to do it. I don't care what type of equipment you're going to use, and yeah. it's you know it's ridiculous that they put that at the end of a commercial with uh, a whole bunch of dogs and then they're getting the people to send them you know 20 bucks a month. It makes drives me crazy. I, I uh, before I moved to the coast, I was the CEO of the Alma Board of California, and we were we were based in Modesto. And um, after, right after I left, our old church had a pretty uh, pretty open-minded minister, and she wanted to get different points of view. And uh, so that issue was the coming up on the Proposition Two in California, and so she had somebody from the poultry industry. And then she had the, the head of the Humane Society from Washington came out to Modesto, which was strange. The church was filled, you know, like the only time other than the Christmas program that it would get filled. But it was filled. And, and they got so excited. He showed that video for one of the first times. And I think, what in the world does this have to do with a debate that was largely about chicken cage size didn't have anything to do with it but they took a picture and associated it with that and that I know a lot of people that believe that that video was the biggest reason that prop 2 passed in California to regulate the cage cage size and also some other confinement things that are in the hopper right now being sued and it just it continues to, to be boiling boiling over so what did, you know? What did I have to do with logic? They were able to control creating, creating a picture and, and raise raise some doubts. You know, this is the other thing that that's happening to us now. Used to be, um, when I was actually I helped pork producers get their first government affairs office going in Washington D.C. 30 years ago. And we'd all put our suits and ties on, and we go to Washington, and we walk up and down the up and down the halls, and many of you have done that, and it, and it, and it was good. I mean, they, you see everybody, and they come to the party that night, and they eat pork chops, and, and you go to USDA, and you go through, and you see the secretary and the deputy secretary, and they'd always give you kind of good feedback. And that's how you, we tended to get things done, and big changes happened in the country. But somewhere in this next last couple of years, the Washington scene's almost gotten irrelevant because this, this court of popular opinion, whatever the law is, and I don't mean to take anything away from you doing government affairs because you've got to keep doing that too, but the ability to get this popular conversation and, and win it, win it like you're going to talk about this <coughs> afternoon on social media, uh, change the conversation with the movable mill. That's the higher stakes that we're facing. Before we get off, people are having a good time with this making your blood boil. Before we get off that, anybody got something else they want to throw out on that? Larry? One thing that irritates me is these talk show hosts that host don't have their information correct. And then they stand by what they say, but if their information is wrong. Yeah. Now, and, and that's one thing that we're doing with farmers and ranchers in our program. Two things I'll mention this, this year. Uh, I just was meeting with Ketchum's uh, head of the sports and entertainment group. She's putting together calls on some of the these people that are producing the films, producing the shows, and so forth. And the other thing is that we're going to do another food dialogues with you, farmers and ranchers. Some of you saw the first one that we did, that we did in Washington, D.C., and in California, and New York, and Fair Oaks. This year, we're going to do two, but one of them, we're going right to Los Angeles, and we're going to do it in June. And like we're going into the belly of the beast because California is going to be talking about modern agriculture a lot this year because of the GMO. So we're going to take the event right into LA and we're going to start kind of working and work on our way through some of these people and their producers.
So sometimes, like we're saying, it does make you just want to hit. You want to strike back. And the trick with U.S. Farmers and Ranchers Alliance, and the main thing we're saying is that we really do like this imagery of getting around the table and getting around the, con the conversation. The <coughs> and we think that we can turn this con this war into a, a conversation. So Maslansky and Partners is a research group where what we did is we went to a lot of places, including probably some of you in this room, and we got the best stories about American agriculture. What do we say about it? What do we say currently? And we and when we started testing those messages, uh, we did these dial sessions. And the dial sessions, again, in Iowa, you've no doubt seen these, maybe some have been in them, where people would, we would have someone, now, now I'll warn you, this person is just very, very flat, very boring, just, uh, just reading it straight, but he reads all the messages like this. And the idea is we took our best messages and then we tested the reaction to them. We didn't want somebody to be, you know, overly sell it. We just wanted it just plain, and so that we could get the audiences across the country to respond to it. What they hear is, but we don't know whether pesticides or antibiotics or home hormones are safe in the long term. What do you guys think of, how do you deal with that? <coughs> the long term health effects? Can no? you clarify what you're asking? Well, okay. Um, so, the people that we're concerned about, they're saying, okay, fine, they're safe, but what do we know about them long term? What do we know about the long term effects of this? It, it raises a doubt that cannot be answered. It raises a doubt. And did some of you see the story about statins this week? Uh, like Lipitor and others? Some of you are like me, started taking them. And so I'm taking Lipitor. <coughs> and, and, and you know, what was it, Roger, that they what? Diabetes. <coughs> yeah, uh, it predisposes certain people toward diabetes if, uh, if they take the statin. Pretty in impressive percentage. And, and you know, some of you that have had your doctor talk to you and say, you know what, your cholesterol's a little high, this is like the safest drug there is. You know, we've had them out there for, what, 30 years or something that they've had statins, and it's like the, it's like the gold standard. And then out of the blue comes a study that says there's health effects. So when we say don't worry, just trust us, there's nothing to worry about, you know, that's gonna, that falls on some deaf ears. But just a question, how well the study was done that did this too. Sometimes the studies aren't really accurate studies to do. That's true. But you know, they've got to end up being a body of work and they're repeatable and they've got large numbers and they'll do it over and over again. But that's, that's as an industry, you know, they're hoping we're, we're looking for, you know, those answers too. And when we say it's affordable, when they hear affordable, we get back to the comment too and saying, well, if we're controlled by companies that are controlled out of Wall Street, you know, where do you cut corners? Where are you taking some shortcuts that, uh, to, to try to keep getting it cheap? And we say we have a, abundance, and when they think of abundance, they think it back to you guys, one of your, one of your uh, products that I left out, uh, high fructose corn syrup. So we look at abundance and, and, and they end up saying, sure, so we can get more supersized Cokes at the, at the 7-Eleven or at the, you know, at the at fast food. And it's causing us, you know, leading to the obesity problem that we have right now, which um, I think, they, I think they, they make the threshold way too low for obesity personally, because I don't like those charts. <laughs> Supposedly, 30% of us are, are obese by those charts. The, but 16 to 16, 17% of children are. And so it's kind of hard to get away from that fact. Now, it could be that somebody along the line ought to say, no, you can't have three Cokes. But that doesn't usually come up in the discussion. <laughs> yep. Uh, I always like to avoid the word affordable because you know, when you get a cheaper price, you can provide a better product. But the idea that it's affordable, I think, is a real negative because you're working here for a profit motive, and most people don't. They work for a salary, and that's becoming a negative thing. I mean, ask Mitt Romney lately about investments and profits. Most people are starting to see a lot of work in a world where profits are not a positive thing. That's, that's right. Because they understand no economics. That's right. That's right. So I just avoid that part. It just so, you know, Here's another. Some of you have been on the Facebook page, 
And, and this, was, this was just snapped off the Facebook page where one farmer came in and said, Don't you, aren't you kind of grateful for the fact that we are producing all this food? And, and, and this person came in and said, yeah, I'm grateful for it, but I don't want food that may have any ill effects on my family's health. You can't take nature and change it the way some people have tried to without negative results. And, and you know, I think we build on that, and I'm going to come back to this in a minute. Uh, somebody jumped in, and then they said, yeah, that away, but then a, a, I'll show you in a few minutes where a farmer jumped in, and she had a good response, and people started engaging in a different way. So the old arguments fall flat. Uh, we don't want to communicate as if everything we do is 100% right. Uh, we acknowledge that there's always room <coughs> for improvement. Uh, we don't really talk about producing more, talking about trying to make optimum use of resources. Like you were saying, you're capturing that fresh, that fresh water that's coming here. You talk about optimum use of the resources. But focus on improvements. Um, uh, they're, they're not asking so much about safety and building, but they can believe you individually when you start talking about improvements. Now, here's where we get into credibility again. You know, we say things, and among ourselves, we're used to saying it, and we hear them a certain ways, but like Dean was saying on the portability, they don't hear the way we say it. So when we say our methods are proven safe, you know, and we're keeping food affordable, we've, uh, most farmers are fam family farms are family run, we care about our land, you know, all these different things that we are able to say, they're hearing that we're tampering with nature at what expense to quality, um, but be holding to the big processors and the, and the bottom line. Um, you'll take profitable shortcuts when and if you can. Uh, you want to produce more to sell more to the world, not just to produce more of the world. You want subsidies and, and lax regulations. Um, you know, what's the long-term effect of pesticides antibiotics, hormones, and so forth. Any comments on that? What's it, you know, we get into some patterns of these, of these kind of comments, and, and we're amazed at, at the reactions people have. You know, when you talk to folks, they individually are supportive of you as individuals. A pretty high rating, really. 75% have a favorable impression of farmers and ranchers. But, they're not so sure about the food that we produce, the ways we, they have real doubts about the way we're growing and raising, raising food, over 75%. And here's another scary one. <coughs> they end up, over three quarters of them, feel like all of the farming is controlled by big corporations. Now, how often are we gonna have to say over and over again that's not the case? It's not registered. You know, I'll bet in this room, I'll, I'll bet the average that have expressed the point about your own farming operation, about your neighbor's farming operations, about the fact that Monsanto isn't running the big farm right next to you or, or things like that. I'll bet every one of you have done this many times. I've had to explain it to people. Maybe not necessarily the people right at home, but you sat by someone on an airplane or you've had to I explain this. Um, you know, I think this is a point that let's take a let's take a few minutes. I want to I, I want to uh, have somebody uh, someone be a consumer that is at uh, like a local Starbucks and you're not too involved with farming but you've been standing in line and you strike up a conversation. Well one of you do you want to? Stand up. Hi, Hi. I, I'm Roger. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you nice know? meeting you. I just bumped into Dean. He's working. Uh, Dean? <laughs> no, <I'm good. laughs> hey, Dean. Yes, sir. I don't know. You Have you two ever met before? Oh, no, no. You wouldn't believe it. He doesn't look like it, but but he's a farmer. And and uh, we're while well, we're standing here in this long line because I can't get my. Uh, my, my skinny uh, double latte, uh, uh, actually with soy, but, uh, but I was using some sweetener you'd all approve of. But aside from that, I'm, they're getting ready to get my order, but you know, I thought it was interesting because you're, I heard you saying some comments about, about food and agriculture and big business, and I'm just wondering, 
I mean, what, as a farmer, and this is a farmer, um, what kind of question would you have for him that's been bothering you, or something that concerns you and some of your friends that aren't involved in farming, that concerns you about uh, about how farm how food's being produced today? Well, not necessarily how it's being produced today, but you know, we've just been seeing everything on the news lately about how much you're making on your farm while we're all suffering at the grocery store and our lattes are going up because <laughs> you're making so much money on your corn. Well, we don't grow coffee in this country. So <laughs> 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 he, he tried to make money off of coffee if he could. <laughs> I know it's a little bit right now, you know. But anyway, well, yeah, I mean, we've had a couple of good years here. Uh, you got to remember in farming, we, uh, it's a commodity. The product we produce, it goes up, it goes down. Generally, we've had a very, very good two or three years here. But on the other hand, you have to remember what is the product we produce and what's it really cost you. We have an extremely low percentage of food costs in this country for the, to the percentage of the income that you make compared to every other country. And I think that's the light we have to take a, take a look at. What do you think? You buying that? No, it's a little confusing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, my, my point is your, your food is relatively cheap compared to the rest of the world. And the way we farm is part of the reason it's as cheap as it is. Of what people concerns people, and you know, all these big issues, uh, hormones, pesticides, antibiotics, antibiotics are going to be really one of the next big issues. I, I've said for a while, this is the year of GMO and antibiotics. Uh, and um, they're, they're coming out of the woodwork on antibiotics. Uh, some of you saw, I did, I hosted something on our Food Dialogues website, a conversation on biotech. And uh, I'm going to do another one on antibiotics, getting a critic, getting somebody that's, uh, that's on the other side of the issue talking about antibi antibiotic use. We're going to wade into those conversations and those discussions. Um, you know, and with people, like we were saying, it's, it's not that it's, it's personal. Uh, it is personal for them because it's about their food. Somebody said, I think we're doing role playing, you wonder about their kids. I mean, you, you wonder about the safety. You know, it's no different. Again, you can't take it personal. It's about farming. Uh, so, some of you have the same question about whether or not you want to give your five-year-old their own cell phone. Uh, because we've already gone beyond that. All the 12-year-olds already have. And we know all the good reasons for it. Now they keep coming up with, wait a minute, if you're letting them carry them around when, you know, when their little skulls are so thin, too young, and they do it for 40, 50 years, is it going to be a bad thing? You think, well, maybe. And they almost look at food almost in the same kind of same kind of question. I have a grandson in Cincinnati. He's three years old, and he, instead of stories, he goes to sleep with an iPad. He, he sits and he's got all these iPad stories. His mom's with him, but he uh, she's got a pile of books, and she tries to force him to go through the books with her. But he he says one of the first things he say is iPad, iPad, and. And he can play, he can see the, uh, the shows he likes best. But I'll tell you, you're gonna kick, you might get kicked out of this. What really puts him to sleep is the last thing she plays is a documentary on corn. <laughs> I mean, it's all right, I swear. I think he's gonna end up knowing a lot. There's a, she has this, it's a well done documentary about everything there is to know about corn and all the corn products. And, and it was done, I think, uh, it's, anyways, a documentary. And I saw it, because I watched with him when I was back in Cincinnati around Thanksgiving. And, but it does put him to sleep. <laughs> so I think what we're all saying here is it's reasonable that people have these questions. Uh, talk isn't cheap. Uh, conversation's really powerful if it's productive and functional. One thing that you guys came to here that you were, before I get to this acronym, you were saying engage, acknowledge, share, earn their trust. You know what really struck me in all these different conversations that I was hearing was when, when you admitted to kind of like some self-doubt or that you could, well, it's a good question or a good point. <coughs> um, one difference, you many of you have been trained and you've gone through media training and I've gone through media training. And when we were media trained, we tend to get into sound bites. We tend to say, this is the way 
you know, exactly this way you state the sentence, as if you're going to get 30 seconds that's going to be on WHO tonight. Uh, you know, and, and what's different is that people crave authentic. They can smell BS like never before. And what doesn't register, what registers is say, you know, I don't know, it's a good question, I'm wondering myself. That registers. I didn't mean to be teasing you there when I said, you know, I can believe you don't know, but that is believable to most people. The world is complicated. How are you trying to get answers? How is you in your industry committed to, to getting answers? So, you engage, you start the conversation, you acknowledge where the questions are, you look for a connection. Have any of you got, um, some uh, a, an unusual spot where you found you made a connection with somebody and you thought this isn't going to matter, but you, you found yourself in a in a in a line on a trip. Any? Yeah. The, well, I think I told you one the other day. There, it's, it's surprising if somebody wants to speak to you on an airplane and they find your phone and come and say I'm an astronaut. They just won't let you go because you're such a unique animal in their life. But it's just unbelievable how engaged you can get just to tell them your story. Have you found that too? I have. Oh, yeah. I have had only one exception to that, and I was I another another uh, one of those upgrades. I want you to know that I am not spending farmer money on first class tickets, but I have got upgraded because I fly a lot. But I was on another upgrade years ago. And, and this gentleman came in and sat down beside me, and it was Willie Brown, the former mayor of San Francisco, and the former speaker of the house in California. And we got just to the point of, you know, what do you do? I obviously knew what he did. And, and, and he just cut me off and he said, you're a farmer. I said, well, I guess so. I've been working for farmers. He said, you're a farmer. And he dismissed me and he wouldn't speak to me the rest of the flight. I've never experienced anything quite so rude in my life. I've never had anybody that shut me off because I was associated with farmers by him. But again, that was the exception. And every, <coughs> almost every other one I can think of, Dean, they, um, they're surprised. Uh, and, yeah, Dean, here, yeah, another one here just in the last week. The time's gonna run together. I come across one of the guys you see on Fox News every day, waiting for the same airplane. So I engaged him about Iowa. And, and he immediately wanted to talk about your agriculture, you know, things are going pretty good in Iowa and so forth. And I immediately switched over to government regulation, how that was getting to be one of our problems, and give a couple of examples. He acknowledged, well, I see what you mean. I mean, <laughs> to me, those are the things that are just right. bullet points, boom, right now, by telling your story when they're, people are used to listening. You, you probably have, uh, you have some organic growers in the organization too. Do you? Well, when I talk with the organic farmers, you know what their biggest concern is now? Regulation. They can't certify it. It's too complicated, too difficult. They're dropping, they're dropping their certification. They have that in common. The other thing that you have in common, uh, needing more research. I mean, a lot of research that's been done with uh, <coughs> organic ends up being really useful to conventional agriculture, too. I mean, everybody, every kind of farmer finds that they can keep working together, too. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. We had a brainstorming session in one of our last meetings. If funds run limited, what should we do? And, and you've just created an idea with me. I think we should all upgrade and apply first class every time. <laughs> <laughs> because... You meet opinion makers. Yeah. You're more likely to make a difference in first class than you are in government. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> well, you do meet you meet people that are all over, all over the world, <laughs> and you and they have they've had other interesting you can discussions. About anything, Kelly. And and what almost always happens with me, they say you work with uh, with farming and agriculture and. And then, you know, well, tell me a little bit about that. And it's somebody that runs a software company. Or it's, uh, one I, just to your point, Wayne, I sat next to this one guy, and he was just coming back from a meeting with the CEO of Chipotle that has that Willie Nelson video. 
And they had an idea that they wanted to put at the Chipotle restaurants of a meet your farmer. And they were going to have a farmer, one of their farmers, uh, you know, be at various Chipotle restaurants to have conversations with them in their case is mostly uh, organic, uh, uh, you know, like Nyman Ranch or something on the pork side and, and those that they were having. But you know why they didn't do it? They kept changing their farmers. They didn't have a dedicated supply. They would, you know, it, even Chipotle, it was a matter of who gave them the best, gave them the best deal. They weren't dug in to just a loyalty to, to a particular farmer. But the idea was powerful that even they, on a, a different perspective, wanted to be able to put somebody in those conversations. That, yeah. You just said something there that I think is is really part of the challenge that we face. Ideas are so powerful, but most of the people that we're trying to engage don't necessarily understand the complexity of, of the businesses that we're involved with and they don't understand how difficult it is. Uh, I mean, the, the example that at Chipotle, they don't have a dedicated source. Well, that's because it is a lot more difficult to do that. I just saw a piece on Market to Market last week talking about uh, uh, Detroit. There are uh, all these people that are using rooftops to grow gardens and, and all the produce that they can provide, but yet the logic says that they will not be able to provide 100% of the produce year-round for all of the people that want it. You can't do that. We don't logically understand what's happening in the industries, the complexity that we have, and they don't realize that the reason we have the system that we have is because that's what has developed, that's what works. Yeah, yeah. You have to be careful you don't give them the whole load of hay. I mean, I think there is a lot of complexity, and I think admitting that it's complicated and you're sorting it through, but giving you some example, maybe you like what you're doing personally, or what, or how you're trying to get on top of it and stay in. <coughs> One example is that I, I was working with a company back east that just wanted to be totally sustainable in their their operation, and they were trying to locally source all the vegetables, fruit and vegetables that they needed, and and they had somebody come in and do the carbon footprint. And the carbon footprint was so much better for them to ship the fruits and vegetables from California than to get them from greenhouses and from uh, from you know the other sources locally. Yeah. One thing I've seen uh, when you engage somebody, if you try not to be too defensive, try not to overwhelm them with the facts, because we've all been we've all been uh, armed with all the facts that we need to kill anything and usually we do and then we don't make any progress but but uh, the thing that I I like to do is is be really enthusiastic yeah. because if if you're enthusiastic you know they think you got something going and the, and they will they want to know you know what you got yeah yeah no that's that's right that's right and you can't kill that uh, you got to be enthusiastic and you and, and you don't want to you know overwhelm them where they get quiet and get back to like your issues within your own family you know I mean you have you have those circumstances where you just start going on and on and you can tell they just clicked off you know they, they may be you know past 13 that they didn't just walk off to the room or something but they're but but whoever you're engaged with you they just stopped listening you lost them so you you You've got to use again this approach like these to and, and acknowledge them to be able to keep the conversation going. I think that's also one of the tricks is that you have a great conversation, but I think we still have to work on how we follow up on it. You know, I think that um, most of these people that we meet at the coffee shop and and the on the airplanes and other places, you never see them again. And so they've had an interesting conversation. You might have made a hook. Uh, sometimes you catch a card from them, or sometimes you can promise to get them some other information. I think it's good. I don't do it as well as I should. Uh, but every once in a while, I've got somebody I've made connections like this that have come back to me, and they've opened another door for another <coughs> conversation. I think the other thing that we're not getting into yet with this program I think these conversations are going to have <coughs> for 
<coughs> policies in our own organizations. I sat through, I saw some of Iowa's policies in, last week in St. Louis of going, starting the process of your resolutions, and I really believe in policy development. And then you get agreement and you get a resolution and say, this is what we stand for. But we, we probably, in our policy development, have to, have to be sure that we're looking at some of these long-term questions, like as our research, you know, checking out some of these things that we still have some questions about. <clears throat> Are we a little too often saying, you know, that's Pfizer's job on antibodies, or that's the Animal Health Institute. We don't have to know about that. Or, you know, Monsanto, DuPont, they're taking care of that. Or the, the regulatory agencies wouldn't approve it. Have any of you gone to Washington to try to go call on the office in charge of you. <coughs> so you got it. It's like EPA, uh, you know, the the other agency, the, um, FDA, USDA. Nobody puts it on their door, and they're a committee. I mean, one you got one strike against it. It's in Washington. It is government. It's run by a committee. I think they're really good people. But when you get in some of these conversations and you try to explain to them how these things are regulated, and they say they're a G15 making $120,000 a year, and someone looks back at you and says, Dean, don't you think they could take a job in St. Louis for $200,000 a year? Yeah. You know? and, and because they're just suspicious yeah. that, that, um, that the regulators are not quite as sharp just as there's, they don't understand that farmers are driving the things they are, and that farmers are running these operations, and that your advance are just a lot of, of suspicion and mistrust. Yeah? I think sometimes we need to get in our mind what, um, what we're defending, because um, I hear so often, you know, we're not factory farms, we're not factory farms, but when I go to buy a vehicle, I'll go buy a Ford, I'll go buy a Chevy, or Exactly. whatever something out of a factory because because it's quality control it's an environment it's research and stuff a lot quicker than i would go buy one from my neighbor who builds a car in, in his shop and so i'm not sure that you know we get these eyes that because we get uniformity and we, get, we have um, more control and more quality and more research we can do more <coughs> that i'm not i'm not sure that's such a, such a we, we can be a better brand than we are why, why is it the same token? Why is it medical biotech is really viewed extremely highly? Exactly. I mean, if many of us unfortunately have had extreme uh, family situations with diseases that you depended on some, uh, something that was a, a biotech medicine, and uh, you know, more power to them. You know, bring it on. You want all the science you can. You want all the tools you can. It has a different image than on food. Well, you hit on, I think, one of the biggest problems with agriculture as a whole. Agriculture is made up of multiple industries within it. You got, like, different, within pork or beef or pork, you got multiple industries, industries and niches within it, and you have only the unifying commodity brand. So you got the bump, bump, bump with beef and the other white meat with pork. But the problem with that is, I mean, look at the image. If The only thing that a commodity group I've seen that can be able to get behind is, you put up a poster of a farm to make so people realize the farm. You always put up the pitchfork image with the barn and the windmill. I mean, we we disassociate ourselves with a factory, and yet we're trying to not have the image personally of a fact or of what we're portraying. I mean, it's confusing the consumer. It is, and the person that they can see at the local farmers market might actually be kind of playing that old role, wearing literally bib overalls. I've seen it at some of the farmers markets and they play up to that where they can feel comfortable with something you know local on the outside of San Francisco or somewhere and uh, and 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 you know when I was at the uh, uh, at the meeting in St. Louis uh, uh, with the the corn growers uh, we were talking about who doesn't have a good image with consumers who don't you trust well who's a, who's high on the list Congress Government, right? Who, who else? You know, lawyers. Yeah, lawyers. Bankers. Lobbyists. Um, how do they dress? Suits, ties, like all the corn farmers in St. Louis. You know, I, and I, and, I, and those are good suits. I mean, I'm wearing a suit too, and and yet we've been into that 
that you know in, in one way we don't want to have this and in the other way we've done so much Washington oriented that we're, we're also just not our natural selves either you know I, I think there is a time to wear a suit and I think it's often when you're going to Washington where everybody else are wearing suits but when you're talking to somebody at Starbucks you're probably not either in a suit or you're not in bib overalls I mean that's that's kind of a crude thing that is uh, there's this image of being of being yourself but also being able to build that confidence and you know what every uh, every time I've gotten into creative groups with agencies and so forth somebody comes back and saying you got to make them appealing and warm and you got to show the cowboy on a horse and you got to you got to show the farmer with the red barn you know uh, you know and, and, and just things things like that that it's you're always button up against it because they say that works. They say you get more sympathy. But it isn't authentic. It, it, it isn't necessarily. Some of us still have barns, but it isn't, it isn't what you're all about anymore. Let me kind of go a little bit more on the engage. You, we've been talking about. Yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. To what extent is the urbanite um, in love with the notion of agriculture, farming, is a lifestyle and to what extent did we not as an industry <coughs> try to shed the lifestyle with the uh, farm crisis of the 80s we are a business we're not a lifestyle yeah and how much are we a victim of our success yeah something to that because as a business business is regulated yeah. Business will not treat you right. Yeah. And and so this is where the natural your factory, your business, you're not trustworthy. Yeah. And and you want they want to go back to when farming was a lifestyle. Well, it's a crazy time. Everything's confusing, moving too fast, you're out of control of things. You'd like to have something that you can hang on to. The old fashioned farmer is appealing to many people. I mean, there's uh, <coughs> billionaires decide they want to go start farming because it appeals to them. If they had all the money in the world, they'd become a farmer or have a winery. Uh, and, and, and I run into a lot of young people that are majoring in agroecology and uh, UC Santa Cruz. And I, in fact, I'll show you one of them right here. But you know what? They just want to be, dig their hands in the dirt. They just want to farm. They're not really against you. They really find it so appealing. They wish there was some way they could be involved in farming. But it is kind of that, you know, control of your own destiny and and uh, all the some of the things that do appeal to you about being a farmer. But it's a co it's it's complicated, you know. And and if you can, if again you engage, you're hearing this, you acknowledge, you share your experience, you empathize with them, you follow through. Hey, I hear you. It's not all that. Some of that's still there, you know. Some of that is why I love being a farmer. Um, but this is some of the complexity. And you'll find people that'll stay with us on that. So you, you know, all different ways we've talked about how you can start a conversation. This group isn't going to have any trouble because you're doing it all the time. Uh, you acknowledge what their concerns are, but they deserve respect. Uh, they are concerned about the long-term health effects. They wonder about the poor treatment of animals. Now, there are some people who don't think you should even eat animals, but and we're not going to change their minds. Uh, but some others just have some questions, you know, um, and and there's ways to help them through some of the questions. You know, I think that uh, when you walk through a whole hog operation. You know, you can get somebody say, "Well, I get it. I, I get it." While you're doing that, and and often you get something like gestation stalls. They just say, "Well, shouldn't they be able to get out every once in a while?" Well, maybe. In fact, some farmers are doing it. That uh, some of the operations, you know, the sow can back up and let her let them out into the the common alley for a while, and they get back in the gestation stall, and they they don't choose to be out all the time. And and they said, "Oh, well, okay." Of course. There's a little problem of it would cost the industry millions of dollars to convert, probably, uh, which nobody wants to hear about. So somebody, we often hear this, have you seen Food Inc? Have, have any, have all of you seen Food Inc? 
I saw a premiere in San Francisco, and they, you know they were just raving, cheering, you know, at, at the end of Food Inc. And so this is an egg producer in, in California, and she waded in, and she's saying that you know I'm happy to show you how we're producing, and in fact they put a you can look there if you want. They've got a live cam in their their uh, their laying house where they uh, where you can see the <coughs> 24 hours a day. You can see what it's like, and they actually have done the transition that they've added the little different cages that would comply with the, the Prop 20 as well. And so someone came back in on Facebook and said, hey, that's really cool, Jill, uh, you know, and can I share the video? So she shared the video, and then someone else said, you know what, that's great. However, it's still a factory farm, and you're still warehousing hens. And I think farmers can do better than this. And then if you look on our Facebook, you see people that are having those conversations. <coughs> then someone else came in, and we go, Terry, she comes back and said, you know what, that corporate farm thing is not going away ever. It's the real world that we're living in. Any producer who attempts to do better conditions of their animals should be applauded and not bashed. You know, that's kind of what we're going for, is more and more people that you might not like exactly the way she chose these words, but she doesn't object to what, to what we're doing. And then if you have to start giving them, again, getting sound bites, that you're speaking for everybody, every farmer, then they don't. They doubt you. Now, how can you speak for everybody? But who can you speak for? That's right, Roger can speak for Roger. And, and, and that is powerful. You know, you're, some of you are saying, well, wait a minute, how can that be that powerful? I'm, I'm sitting across the table from somebody and they're not telling me, all of Iowa does this and all of corn growers do this. And, and they're thinking, yeah, 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 well, maybe. But if you're saying, if you're looking somebody in the eye or you've ex exchanged your rapport on uh, Facebook or something, and, and they, can, they can sense that credibility that what you know about is, you know, this is what, how, I'm, how I'm improving. I think every one of you would say, I've improved my farming operation every single year. I would, I would bet, make a large wager that before you leave here today, at least one of you are going to have an idea that somebody made some comment to you that you're going to follow up on. Because that, as someone's pointed out, is what farming is. Agriculture today, we say, is continual improvement. But when we talk about the, the continual improvement, we have to be sure that uh, how we talk about it, it's about improvement, it's about innovation, it's that we're not perfect, but we've got specific examples. Uh, we do have to be careful of, of language you know, uh, when we say pesticides and when we talk about GMOs, antibiotics, and hormones, you know, I, I don't want us, again, to get back in the trap of just trying to uh, soundbite everything, but know that when you say pesticides, if you're talking about, you know, preventing pest problems, you know, different ways of recording it, it's, it's better of uh, maintaining growth. I mean, you do want to think a little bit more about, are these words that, that that as soon as you say that word, it's going to pesticides, poison. So, you know, you, you do want to think before you speak, which I don't always do. Uh, and, but, but not at the price of authenticity. So if you get into talking about GMO labeling, go for it. You know, we're saying that, that bringing up just GMOs is going to get people to kind of jerk the reaction. And, uh, and, and yet, I would say that if you prioritize how you communicate, I think being the real deal and being authentic and, and engaging and occasionally you'll use one of those hot button words or it just slips out that you were trying not to, but it just slips out, you know, go for it. Because above everything, it's being real, uh, being authentic, because your stories are, are good. You, they're a good, solid improvement. You know, like we said, you've all done something in the recently that is is um, that's an improvement and that means something that's a story when you sit down and you're talking to these people and you, you got that long flight or you're having a cup of coffee you met them at a gathering or something I'm doing this at uh, with a, a church group I've I thought um, you know we ended up having a discussion group for the for the men 
on Saturday morning, and uh, I was surprised uh, how many of these concerns were in our were, were in our group. And afterwards, they said, "Gee, I hadn't thought about it that way." And you know, and, and people have come up to me since and said, "I had a chance to be in a conversation the other day, and I told somebody that, you know, something that I thought of differently after we had our conversation, which is even better than the conversation yourself." It's the conversation the person you have the conversation with has a conversation with. <clears throat> and you affect it, and they don't even forget who you were or where it came from. But it shades their conversations going forward. And, and you know, it just spreads and spreads and spreads. And, and this wasn't kind of pounding them over the head, uh, you know, with facts and figures. It was engaging. It was having a conversation. It was making sure that we are that we're connecting, that we're that um, that we're admitting that we're not perfect, uh, and showing that we're we're willing to uh, keep pushing ahead. You know, we're trying to get better all the time, and and getting those conversations going. And again, I'm really pleased to know that you've already done so much, and your groups and various new organizations are forming, doing such. You're really jumping in out there. And I'm glad that this group's not only here this morning and some of the feedback I've gotten this morning, but I think that what you're going on to this afternoon, that more into the social media and trying to get comfortable with, uh, with Engage. And one thing that I wanted to demonstrate with pulling out these, your phones today. You know what, um, a year ago, not not a third of you would have that capability and that power <coughs> we would have. that yeah. um that we can take up well, how many did we have going here 25 30 or so videos and and you know we can get them <coughs> up on youtube we can get these kind of searchable so that they're they're showing up and the conversations can start shifting a lot we're seeing it with farmers and ranchers already. If you haven't checked out our website, go to fooddialogues.com. Uh, we, are, we are watching the conversations every night. We're seeing what's happening. We're beginning to change the tone of the conversations. We're looking across everything that's being said on the internet that uh, we're seeing how they're referring to farming. Uh, when we started, we just had started this program in June. And at the beginning, even before June, we started looking at the amount of conversations online about farming, and most of them were negative. And we found in the first month we had like 400,000 conversations, and those spun out to millions of people. Far and away, it was more negative than positive about farming. And so, but we can track it. We can see what we're doing. We can get the conversations. We're going to keep stepping it up. We're going to keep farmers at the table, working together, and promoting having these conversations like this. So, let me let me slow down here. Any other got any questions, comments? Yeah. I didn't see anything on CNN today. I'm guessing a lot of people did, but talk about positive messages in farming. Um, there's a dairy that now have waterbeds for their cattle. I saw on the news. Wow. And it just left such a neat feeling. I'm thinking, you know, I can just practically see these cows jumping up and down on the waterbed having a great time, but they were talking about their pressure points and how they're much more comfortable and uh, that they uh, are producing more milk as a result. And he talked about the cost to the grower, but. I like to be a cow in that place. All I can think of is what with, with your kind of money. Not just, especially in terms of more animal. Hey, why are people completely fine with a homeless person being beaten to death, but if a cow is sick and injured and can't get up, that captures everything? Well, or, or not just, I'm not saying news, but I mean just in a lot of people's psyche. For some reason, the cow is, that's a serious thing <coughs> to be fixed right now. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would say an awful lot of people really are moved by the, by the homeless situation. And we have, 
we have a lot of people that are active and lots of programs on it too and they're uh, they have more seeing that as well uh, but I think it's just an emotional thing I mean it's it's uh, no one likes to see an animal that's that's hurt or in pain and it, it just hits it, it hits a nerve you know it, I could have bought a whole cow for that with that root canal <laughs> cost. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I, can, I, I, I bet I could walk down my block and I could get stories like that every other house. And, 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 and I also think that I could show 95, 90% of them would sympathize with that downer cow being lifted on a fork. And, and you can say, well, think about that. And they said, I know, I know it's not fair, but it may, you know, gave me a bad feeling. But once they get bad feelings, they have this story pattern that gets in their brain, and and again, facts don't matter too much. And so when you start controlling that emotion, but I've learned you can always counteract that with just personal analogies that they find funny. I mean, one of the most common ones. Don't ask me why. Men always go, hmm. But women always want to know why do you castrate a bull? Because that's just horrible. Shouldn't it be natural? And I always just sit there and go, yeah. I feel sorry for the buddy too, but. Would you want 50 dudes writing you every day? Yeah. And suddenly, it's... <laughs> you, didn't, you didn't put that on the video you sent to me. No. What people will all sudden realize when you take that out of the animal context and you put it in the human context... <laughs> I well, I, I tell you though, I, I can't go, I can't go any further with that. Uh, some some of your videos may hit the highlight tape. That one won't. But you know, I mean, we're going to be just around the corner. Uh, there's some new products coming out that are going to be castration by vaccination, and and uh, so those products are going to start start rolling out. On the one hand, you'll have a lot less death. Uh, but then the people say, ooh, that sounds terrible. Yeah, that open up it does. It does. And, and, and that's going to be, that'll be a conversation next year. Uh, because uh, because I, I think the company's probably been announcing it. It's coming. And, and then how you, deal, how you deal with that one. Well, it's not an easy one to deal with. But, I mean, we've all seen, you know, pigs, pigs die from our normal castration once in a while, not many, but some can. And this is going to be better in a lot of different ways, but it's a it's another story. This is like too much information in some cases. And I think that that's the other thing is that, you know, we can't assume they want to know everything. You know, I think you engage, you acknowledge, you share information, but, you know, they don't necessarily want to know everything. They want to have a way of approaching this. Any other comments? We used to dock our sheep with the left skater rubbing on the tail. Yeah. We had an orphan lamb one time with my sister's pet. Well, she was chasing it around the yard. She was grabbed by the tail, and the lamb ran away, and she had the tail. <laughs> and mom wouldn't let her. She was the last skater rubbing after that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you, you know, I think the thing is that what we've, what we've reinforced here today is that we, we certainly have a lot of stories. And I think we're all in agreement that the game is changing a little bit. I think also all of us, if we stop to think about it, have experience in creating opportunities for conversation. And that there's ways that when we get into these conversations, it's not getting into the debate. It's not trying to take on the argument and show them where they're wrong. Uh, you know, you're wrong about this, you're wrong about that. You know, it's finding something that you can acknowledge is going to be more successful. You can acknowledge a shared interest. It's sharing a personal experience. I think it's fine to work in things about the whole industry. I think, but don't expect that to be your winning approach. What they're going to say is, I can, I can look at this person, or I can see this person online, and I can tell them, I can tell that they're speaking honestly from the heart. This is a hard to do, and that you show an interest in them, and you earn their trust and it may actually lead to some other communications. So I'm looking forward to hearing what, uh, in fact, I've got some handouts here. Pass them a little bit both both sides. These are just little cards to kind of remind remind you. We've got some there. Uh, and these are all the things we're talking about today. And I'm looking forward to hearing back from Mindy and from some of you again on your experiences. I'm anxious to hear how you go this afternoon, too. 
but how the conversations go. And I would ask, I would ask you to just do a couple things. Consider what we talked about. Think about it, but engage. You know, if everybody in this next couple days on your way home, uh, you know, before the weekend's over, try out the conversation. Engage in the conversation. See how that goes. And a few of you are going to have, uh, you know, you're, you're going to get to go, uh, run out to California. And you're going to have some encounters on the flight. And you're going to be talking about something that scares people, technology. I mean, a lot of our advances are from technology. The word technology uh, kind of gives people, you know, the, the <coughs> they kind of worry about it. And it's, uh, so you are kind of going through a minefield. But listen, you know, and, and try to respond and engage those conversations. I'm looking forward to seeing if some of these emails come through. If you didn't do it, send me, send me an email of the, of the, of the video. And I, I'm, I might splice some of these up and use in sessions like this <coughs> uh, and, you know, put them together to be able to just share conversations. You know, it's going to be noisy. One thing I think I could tell when you were all talking uh, because everybody was talking at once, that's a, what they used to, um, the teaching method of uh, blabbing or something like that that the Quakers there. did, or, you know, when they all talked at one time, the, the years and years ago, but when you have all that going on at once, all that commotion, everybody talking at once, there's, you know, there's going to be just, it's, it's going to be noisy, it was hard to hear them, but what you did is you began a, a tool of communications. You, pulled out your, your phones, you did a little video, you sent it, you could get it online, you could get it on YouTube, you can get somebody that's sharing something you don't want to lose, and and it's a, it's a good next step. Uh, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to come out and join you, and I really applaud what you're doing. I'm proud as I can be of people that, uh, that are in agriculture that are standing up and trying to really work together, something we've talked about a lot. Proud to be associated with the Farmers and Ranchers Alliance. Uh, hope that uh, you participate, uh, you get involved individually, you get onto the website. Appreciate the organizations joining and supporting it. Let's keep making work together. So, thank you.